as well as sort of your roles as an academic. So academic literacy is going to begin with critical thinking and rhetoric. So we're going to start with rhetoric. Um, Aristotle is the one who defined the term rhetoric. He said um, it is the faculty of observing in any given case the available means of persuasion. So essentially, or in other words, rhetoric is the art of finding ways to persuade an audience. Um, rhetoric also involves um, understanding when people are trying to persuade you. So you can see that it's very important in terms of higher education. Uh, rhetoric was actually the first discipline to be taught in any higher education setting. Um, essentially, the idea was that um, if adults were going to be participating in democracy, then they should be able to understand when somebody was trying to convince them of something and to convince others of their ideas. Um, rhetoric instruction began in about 500 BCE in ancient Greece, and Aristotle was actually one of the first instructors of rhetoric. So rhetoric along with critical thinking, um, are sort of the most important skills that you're going to gain in your education. Um, so critical thinking is sort of the ability to interpret information and form our own thoughts, beliefs, and judgments about that information. And then rhetoric is the ability to turn around and share those thoughts, ideas, or beliefs in an effective way that gives us credibility and allows us to accomplish our goals. Now, there's different kinds of rhetoric, and we're going to look at a few of them. Um, manipulative rhetoric, deceptive rhetoric, civil and effective rhetoric, which that's the one that we should be aiming for, and then receptive rhetoric. So manipulative rhetoric is obviously where you try to manipulate somebody. Deceptive rhetoric is where you intentionally withhold information to sort of deceive people. Civil and effective rhetoric is when you try to convince somebody of something because you genuinely believe it or you think that it's in their best interest. And then receptive rhetoric is when something is particularly attuned to a certain group or person. So for example, when you were a kid, if you knew how to ask your mom for something in a way that would guarantee that you got what you wanted, that's kind of like receptive rhetoric. Um, it's our job as informed citizens and consumers to really understand how rhetoric works so that we can not only be wary of manipulation or deceit, but also to help educate others. Okay, so let's take a look at this poster. This is a Navy recruiting poster um, from decades past, obviously. And we see that it says on there, gee, I wish I were a man. I join the Navy. Um, and so if we look at this and we kind of ask ourselves, what kind of rhetoric is going on here? Immediately off the bat, we know it's not civil and effective rhetoric, and it's not receptive rhetoric because it's aimed at a lot of people. So if you said that that last poster was manipulative rhetoric or manipulation rhetoric, you were correct. Um, it's manipulative because it's manipulating man, uh, men into thinking that they're not manly enough if they don't join the Navy or the military to help participate in the war efforts. It's also manipulative because it implies that women are the weaker sex and wish that they could be like men. Okay, so what about this one? When we look at it, it has a bottle of pomegranate juice on it, and it says, cheat death, the antioxidant power of pomegranate juice. And we can see that there's a noose around the juice, but it's been 
broken off. Like this person has somehow escaped death. So what kind of rhetoric is this? Is it manipulative? Is it deceptive? Is it civil and effective? Or is it uh, receptive? We know it's not receptive because it's really designed for all people. And it's not really civil and effective rhetoric. If you said it is deceptive, then yes, you are correct. So um, while palm pomegranate juice claims to have life-saving capabilities and asserts that it can be used to treat or prevent heart disease or various cancers. Unfortunately, if you drink pomegranate juice, you will still die. The statistics I believe right now are 100% of human beings die at some point. Um, so this is obviously by no means a miracle drug. And the Federal Trade Commission actually um, said, hey, palm juice, you can't say that your juice cheats death because you don't actually have any scientific evidence to prove that. Okay, so let's leave rhetoric for just a moment and kind of jump over to critical thinking. These two skills are going to go hand in hand, um, not just throughout this class, but throughout your whole college education. Um, so I want you to have a really good idea of what these skills are and how you can use them to sort of um, take hold of your education. So critical thinking involves a couple of things. Understanding the logical connections between ideas. Understanding how this idea, you know, affects another idea or correlates to or connects to. Um, so a lot of times we will, you know, read something in literature class and then study something in history and then study something in environmental biology. But what critical thinking really strives to do is make those connections as to how all of the different things that we are learning really connect to each other. Critical thinking also involves identifying, building, and evaluating arguments. Um, if you've ever asked yourself, what is somebody trying to convince me of and why, that is critical thinking. Um, critical thinking involves solving problems systematically, um, not just one time by dumb luck you figure out the solution to the problem, but how can you repeat that over and over again and create a system to solve problems. It um, involves identifying the significance of ideas. Um, so everybody has ideas, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's ideas are equal in terms of will they work, are they feasible, you know, is this actually a good idea. And then lastly, but probably most importantly, critical thinking involves reflecting on the justification of one's worldview, belief, and values. It is a very important skill to be able to say, this is how I see the world, and this is how that, you know, affects my interpretation of information. Because we all have our own worldview, belief system, and set of values. And that is wonderful, uh, but you do have to be aware of how your particular belief system affects how you see everything else. So in addition to understanding the concept of rhetoric and critical thinking, I want you to really be able to apply them to your education as skill sets that you are working on. It's very important in college to really claim your own education. This is going to be different than something like high school, right? You are here because you chose to be here. So really pondering that, thinking on it, um, and understanding that question will help you. Just asking yourself, how can I invest in my education? And that means so much more than money. It means energy, time, and effort. I want you to really think about what are the benefits of academic literacy in college as well as after college. Um, I want you to, especially for this course, consider how writing can help you take advantage of those benefits. 
We're going to talk a little bit today about what habits you can practice to become literate sort of within your academic community, as well as how social relationships with classmates and professors influence what you write, when you write, and how you write. And then the last thing that we're going to talk about today is just how to incorporate different ways of thinking, knowing, speaking, and writing in how your different roles as a writer will affect your college education. So if somebody were to ask you, are you literate? Of course your answer would be yes. You know, if you're here in 1301, you have the ability to read and write. But I do want you to be aware that there are several different types of literacies and we're gonna talk about them. And it's not necessarily that one is better than the other. They're all important and they can all help us in life. And also I want you to be aware that if there's a particular um, literacy or skill set that you don't have, it doesn't mean that you can't have it. So the first one is literal literacy. This is obviously your ability to read and write in your native language. And sort of connected to that one is cultural literacy. This is language that is used within the knowledge of a shared culture, including dominant ideologies, values, or even biases. So here I say, um, you know, literal literacy has to do with your native language. You know, a lot of times, especially in the American school system, um, students who have a language other than English as their first language are treated um, not as well as they should be or as if they're somehow behind the curve. A lot of times, especially in American, you know, cultural education, we get the idea that English is standard. And that is definitely um, not the truth. So, you know, when we talk about um, literal literacy, we're talking about being proficient in um, your um, cultural language or your native language. And then we also have critical literacy. This is the use of language for the purpose of questioning the status quo. If you've ever met somebody or if you are the type of person who asks why about everything, you probably have a high level of critical literacy. If somebody tells you something and you want to know why it's that way, how it became that way, you know, is that the best way or is there possibly, you know, something else that we can do that would be better, you know, you're probably very critically literate. Um, this is an important skill to have in college. I'm not going to tell you that you should be a cynic, but you kind of really should question everything and make sure that the information that you're getting is valid information. We also have um, something called academic literacy. These are ways of thinking, reading, speaking, and writing that really work well in the academic setting. Some people just tend to be naturally very good students. Um, their brain and the you know traditional school setting click well for each other. If this is you, great. If this is not you, also great. But there are things that you can do to just improve your academic literacy. And then the last kind of literacy that I have up here is cyber literacy. This is the ability to read, navigate, write, and respond within electronic communication. So the internet, things like that. There are people who can hop on any computer and do anything that you want them to do and it just comes very natural to them. If this is you, great. This is not you, also great. But there are definitely things that you can do to improve your cyber literacy. Um, you know, we're all kind of practicing new skill sets with online learning. Um, and so, you know, you can always be continuously improving in all of these topics. Okay, I want to talk about academically literate or how to become more academically literate um, for just a few minutes. So just like anything else in life, achieving academic literacy requires practice. 
and real life practice. You can read a handbook on how to write a research paper all day, but until you actually begin the process, you don't have a sense of kind of what questions you're going to need to ask and what are the skills that you will need. So you probably already have a lot of the strengths and skills that you need for academic literacy. Sometimes it just comes um, in the ability to sort of say, hey, I have this skill set and I can use it in an academic setting. So I really want to encourage you to know your strengths. Um, do you have a knack for asking good questions? questions. I feel like in lots of classes there's students who ask really good questions and because those students exist it's easier for all the other students in the class because a lot of times your professor will think oh I explained this thoroughly they should get it and when one student's like hey I have a question they realize that maybe they didn't explain it as thoroughly as they thought or there's something else that they can add. If you have a knack for asking good questions, um, then definitely appreciate that strength. Um, do you always seem to be the one engaged in a lively debate with friends at a party? This is definitely um, an important strength to have. Um, the ability to debate things and to see things from more than one angle and to say to somebody, yes, but what about this? Or no, because of this. This is a good strength that a lot of people have. Um, a lot of times these kids might have, you know, debated everything with their parents. They might have been the ones that got in trouble at home or sometimes in class when they wanted to debate their teacher. But this is actually a strength, um, the ability to kind of look at things from different perspectives. Are you good at listening for main points in a lecture? Um, so obviously there's two types of people in the world. The first type, you say, hey, what was that movie about? And they give you a 30 second rundown. The second type is when you say, hey, what was that movie about? And they spend three hours describing a two hour movie, right? The ability to summarize, to pick out the main points, the things that really matter is definitely a skill or a strength that you can use in an academic setting. Um, this next one appears is, are you comfortable asking people to help you find information you need? Um, you know, you would think that everybody has the ability to ask questions, but they really don't. So if you are comfortable with and familiar enough to know who to ask questions to, to be able to ask questions, to get the help or the information that you need, this is also a strength that will help you in an academic setting. Um, are you skilled at noticing biases and judging others' arguments in conversation? If you can kind of naturally pick up on these things, once again, that's a great skill to have. Uh, do you have a poetic flair that explores the irony of situations? Sometimes people can um, just say things in a more poetic or a more well-written way than others. That's definitely a great skill to have. And then this last one up here could possibly be the most important. Are you an experienced user of the internet? Um, today's educational practices and even carrying into the workplace, it's not necessarily about knowing everything. It's about knowing where to find the answers. So even if you don't have the answer, if you know where to find the answer, um, you may be better off than some of your coworkers or students. So these practice, some of which you may have already developed just because of your personality and your life experiences, will all help you respond to academic assignments. Okay, so I want to talk about how you take some of these skills and put them to use in your college classes. And all of these skills will be used in what we call reading critically. So we're gonna talk about how you read something critically. So reading critically will be used in almost every assignment, every paper, and every class in your college career. So there's some things that I want you to do when you read for school. Um, before you begin reading, 
anything at all, think about why you're reading it and what you hope to accomplish by reading it. And then I really want you to think about the subject matter. Obviously, if you're proficient in the sciences, you probably will read a biology textbook much quicker than somebody who is not as proficient in the sciences. So think about, is this something that I'm familiar with? What do I need to do to be able to understand this information? And how fast or slow do I need to go? And then when you actually begin reading, I highly encourage every student to take notes in their textbook or on a separate sheet of paper. Um, highlight, 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 because you will read something and think, huh, that's important. But if you don't highlight it, it will be much more difficult to go back and find it. Um, circle unfamiliar words. If you come across a word you don't know what it means, circle it. And then look it up in the dictionary and see if it makes sense in the context. If there are words that are repeated often, I also encourage students to circle those. They could be important. Um, see if you can identify the author's thesis or main idea and then definitely make note of it. Um, write a summary of each paragraph or section. A lot of times when I'm reading just outside the section or paragraph, I'll write a one or two word summary. Um, when you have to go back and look for information and in what you've read, this makes it much quicker to find it. Um, write down questions that you have as you read and then go back and answer those questions. And then when you see a visual aid included in something, um, write a quick explanation of why it was included. The author had a purpose in the inclusion of that visual aid, so see if you can figure out what that purpose was. So in addition to sort of taking notes all over your textbook or using little post-its to take notes in your textbook, I want you to really think about the rhetorical content when you read. Um, what is the author's purpose? Why are they writing this? Who's the audience? Who is it intended for? Who was meant to read this? Is this a textbook written for third graders or a textbook written for, you know, master's students. Um, what is the genre? There's obviously a huge difference between science fiction and an article written for a science journal. So think about genre. Um, what is the stance? Is the author curious or angry? Is the author passionate, objective, informative? Is the author trying to convince you of something? And if so, do you agree with them? And then lastly, uh, media and design. What is the media? Meaning, where is this published? Is it published on a blog? Is it published on a newspaper? Is it published in a book? And does that make a difference? I also want you to read for argument. Um, if there's an argument in what you are reading, I want you to think about some things. The first thing that I want you to think about is what type of reasons is the author giving for their stance or their argument? Are they appealing on your emotions um, or are they appealing to your intellect? Are they appealing to your morality and ethics? Is the author credible? So for example, we probably want and want medical advice from somebody who's not a doctor or a medical professional. So ask questions about things like that. Um, is the author trying to find common ground? And is the author addressing the counter arguments? Um, this is a huge red flag if the author isn't addressing the counter arguments that maybe this author could be biased. In addition to using those rhetoric and critical thinking or critical reading skills in college classes, I want you to use your creativity skills. Um, everybody is creative. Creative is just something that your brain does. It might not look the same as somebody else's, but everybody has some degree of creativity. So have fun with whatever degree of creativity you have play with ideas, free write, make lists, draw pictures, 
anything that helps you understand an idea or a topic better is good. Um, don't wait until the last minute. They've done lots of studies on this, and you're actually less creative if you are rushed. If you have plenty of time to complete a project, your brain will think of, you know, all sorts of fun ideas. Don't be afraid to take risks. Um, you know, have fun with what you're doing and ask questions. I also want you to persist. The truth is, is that college is hard. It's hard for almost everybody, um, but that doesn't mean that it's not worth doing. So kind of at the end of the day, a good motto to have is just don't quit. If you don't quit, you win. Um, remember that you will encounter setbacks. It happens. It sucks. Move on, but don't let it stop you. Um, it's important to make a plan and stick to it as much as possible. Break large projects into smaller projects. Um, I always say when you have a whole list of things to do, do the hardest one first because then your brain goes, you know what, if I can do that, I can do anything, but pay attention to due dates. If you don't understand something, ask for clarifications. Uh, your professors are here to help you. So if you're like, I really am missing something on this assignment, um, please, please, please ask because you, you know, don't want to put a lot of work into something and realize at the end you did it wrong or you did something incorrectly because you didn't ask for clarification. Um, and then once you ask for help, take advantage of help when it is available. And then in addition to being creative and thinking rhetorically and using those critical thinking skills um, and even, you know, persisting, I want you to take responsibility for your education. Just sort of acknowledge that how much you learn and what grade you receive depends mostly on you. Um, treat school like a job or a relationship. Say you met somebody that was just great and you really wanted to get to know them, you really vibed with them, you probably wouldn't say, hey, I will think about you on Thursday mornings from 8 to 9.30, but that's it. Outside of that time, I'm not going to think about you, I'm not going to text you, I'm not going to call you. You know, that relationship would probably never get off the ground. So you definitely want to think of school like it is a job or a relationship. I encourage all of my students to get organized, to use a planner, either a paper one or an electronic one like on your phone or both, but you should definitely have a list of assignments somewhere that you are working on. And then lastly, never stop learning. Even if it's not an assigned topic, there's something new in the world to learn every day. So if you put all of those things into practice, you will have a pretty good skill set for being successful in college. Um, we're going to spend the last few minutes of today's lecture just kind of talking about different roles that you will probably play um, as an academic. And the roles we're going to talk about are academic thinker, class member, peer editor, and writer in process. So let's start with your role as an academic thinker and look at what that means. One of the things I always encourage students to do is to be an active researcher. If you don't know what something means, please, please look it up. Um, download a dictionary app. You'll have it with you all the time. If this is not a skill that you developed in high school, it's definitely not too late to develop this skill as an adult. Be patient with yourself. There's a lot of words in the English language. Nobody knows them all. Um, and then when you learn new words, you can drop vocabulary bombs on your friends. Um, and then seek out glossaries. There's so many um, synonyms that we have in the English language, and they're a lot of times often pretty fun to use. 
conference with your instructors, um, please make this an academic habit. It doesn't matter if it's a face-to-face -face class or an online class. Make an effort to get to know your instructor and to share your academic needs with your instructor. If there's something that you need from a class, your instructor might not be able to provide it if they don't know that it's a need. So please be upfront and talk to them um, and let them know when things are going on in your life. If you have questions, if you need additional help, set up an appointment with an instructor. Um, build peer relationships. Um, academic loneliness is a real thing and it can be especially frustrating because a lot of times we need people to talk about um, school with. So if you're the only person in your life that you know that is a college student, spend some time developing relationships with your classmates, join a club on campus, something like that. So you have people that are going through the same things as you. Um, have someone who checks in on you if you miss class. Make a friend in the discussion board in an online class or in a face-to-face -face class and say, hey, can you sort of be my go-to person if I miss class and you know I can get the notes from you or you can get the notes from me if you miss class. Sharing that you know responsibility with somebody can help develop a good academic relationship. And then have someone who will study with you. Um, oftentimes we learn better when we're trying to teach materials to others. So if you have somebody that you're studying with, this is a good opportunity to practice this skill set. Okay, let's talk about your role as a class member and what that means. So first off, let me say this, go to class. Um, doesn't matter if it's an online meeting or a face-to-face -face meeting. If you're supposed to be there, be there. Um, you know, ironically enough, students who show up in class tend to do better. Um, view class meetings as an opportunity. You're going to get to learn more about the topic that you're studying. Um, stay focused, be an active listener. Be an agent of change by insisting that your education is more than just a series of information bases in your head. It's something that you are learning. It's something that's changing you as a person, not necessarily just a checklist of things that you have to get done before the end of the semester. Keep a pen or laptop in hand when you listen to a lecture. Um, take notes the whole time. And then after you take those notes, manage your notes. Go back, revise them, rewrite them if you have time. Um, this really helps to just sort of cement these ideas in your mind. Initiate class discussion. You can do this in face-to-face -face classes as well as in online classes. So you don't just want to be the guy on the discussion board who's like, um, you know, that's great, or I agree. Initiate those discussions and say, but have you thought about this? Or that's a great point, what about this? And then participate in study groups as they are available to you. Okay, so let's talk about your role as a peer editor. Um, in an upcoming class, you're gonna to get to practice these peer editing skills. So it's a good idea to know kind of what will be expected of you. So be a great peer editor. Um, when you get another student's essay to read, I'm going to ask that you read it once before you even begin to edit the essay. Then read it at least two more times. Pretend that you are the intended audience. If you were the professor, how would you grade this essay? Um, and then always be honest. Don't be like, this is great if it's not great. But be constructive. That means figure out what they can use to build on to make their essay better. Be specific about issues, and then look at grammar mechanics as well as 
craft. So yes, you're looking, did they spell this word correctly? But you're also looking at, is this a well-written piece? So after you have read a peer's paper, you definitely want to give them some feedback on it. Um, I always suggest giving compliments first. I've never read an essay that didn't have something great about it. So start there. And then make suggestions. If this were your essay, what would you do to improve it? Offer advice on corrections and share resources that you just happen to be aware of that maybe they don't. And then when your peer editor responds to your work, um, be open to criticism. Keep an open mind. If they say something that you don't get, ask for clarification if you need it. Uh, don't ever take it too personally. I always like to tell students, remember, we're judging your papers, not your soul, right? Your peer editor is just trying to help you turn in the best possible paper you can. Thoughtfully consider your peer editor's suggestions. But remember, at the end of the day, it's your work, your grade, your writing. You have to do what you feel is best. Okay, and lastly today, I want to talk about your role as a writer in process and what that looks like. So we've talked about brainstorming and pre-writing. This is always the first step in the writing process, and honestly, students like to skip this step, but it's so important, and it generates better work. So this step takes as little as 10 minutes sometimes. Don't skip it. Spend time thinking about your essay topic, your essay assignment, what you're going to write about before you begin. Then gather all of the materials that you need to write, um, your research, your brainstorming, your outline, all of that stuff, and then sit down and begin to write or draft. And write until you're finished. Um, don't stop. A lot of times students say this is the point of the writing process where they get writer's block. So writer's block usually has to deal with a desire for perfection. If I can't do it right perfectly the first time, then I don't want to do it at all is sometimes what our brain says to us. So sit down and write with the understanding that your first draft is not going to be beautiful, that you're going to have to make lots of changes to that first draft, and that's okay. But when you give your brain permission to do something that's not perfect, you'll have an easier time getting that draft out, and then you can always go back and edit it. So we all envision a draft that comes out of our brain to the computer screen perfectly the first time. But the truth is, is that just doesn't happen. Not even to the best of writers. So drafts are not supposed to be perfect. They are works in progress. Even the final copy that you turn in will really just be the best possible at this time draft. So even professional writers agree that when they look back on their published works, they think of ideas that might have worked better or could have been finessed, sentences that could have been polished more. But understanding that you're doing the best you can in this particular step of the writing process will help you get your ideas out, and then you can go back and revise and edit them later. And revision and editing is actually what we will be talking about in the next lecture. So between now and then, I want you to think about your role as an academic and the areas of academic literacy that you excel in, as well as how you can use rhetoric and critical thinking to help make you the best college student possible.